The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Son of David. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem with palms in their hands gathered to greet your dearly beloved son when he came into his holy city, grant that we may ever hail him as our king, and when he comes again may go forth to meet him with trusting and steadfast hearts and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel for Palm Sunday, according to St. Matthew in the 21st chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, you shall say, says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king comes to you humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us go forth in peace. Let us go forth in the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Beloved in the Lord, Jesus said to his apostles, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You have been baptized and catechized in Jesus. 
And Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace, and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of, these, of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptisms, then answer, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil, then answer, yes, I renounce him. Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works, then answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways, then answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, then answer, yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Yes. yes. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? Then answer, I do. I do. Do you confess the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from the small catechism to be faithful and true? Then answer, I do. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Then answer, I do by the grace of God. I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word and deed, to remain true to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Then answer, I do by the grace of God. I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession in church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Then answer, I do by the grace of God. And so we rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized and have received the teaching in the Lord, that you have confessed the faith and absolved your sins, and as you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, come forward. Molly Jean Dunkman. The Almighty God and Father of us all, Bless you and your household now and throughout your life as the Lord carries and saves you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Even to your old age I am he, and through gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, and I will carry, and will save. Isaiah 64, 46, verse 4. Adam Scott Grove. May our gracious God, who abides with you at all times and places, keep you free from sin and death, and as you continue to pursue the truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, John 8, 31 to 32. Ryan Zachary Hargett. May the eternal God keep you strong and grant you courage wherever your Lord leads you in your life's journey. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9. Jason Paul Hart. May our faithful God keep your heart clean and your conscience clear as you continue steadfastly in the faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 22 and 23. Brianna Emma Louise Miser. May our gracious and loving God shield you from all danger of body and soul as you find refuge in Christ Jesus. Amen. Every word of God proves true. 
He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Jonathan Edward Niemeyer. May our almighty God bless you with boldness and bravery, but temper it with love and compassion. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9. Trey Eugene Stevens. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ continue to teach you to trust in him, and may you commit to the way of the Lord that he has revealed to you in his word through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Psalm 37, verse 5. Gabriel Lane Willis. May our Almighty God bless you with a quiet strength and boldness that will not give in to fear and confusion through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 9. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them both with the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that bringing forth the fruits of faith, they may continue steadfast and victorious to the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you, and depart in peace. Amen. Serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. The epistle reading for Passion Sunday found in Philippians chapters 2 speaks of following our Lord's example of obedience and it describes his saving twofold rule as our humble servant and exalted king in our Savior's states of humiliation and exaltation. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Glory to you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God the Father. You sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant us that, having been reconciled to God, we may with transition now from Palm Sunday to what is commonly called the Sunday of the Passion. We're not going to be reading the gospel lesson that is found on the back of your bulletins, but instead we now remember the Passion of our Lord from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 26th and the 27th chapters. Glory to you, O Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. After 
Jesus' triumphal entry, his re-entry now is quite different than what it was just a few or five days before. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Then Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, then the high priest tore his robes and said, he's uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And the answer, he deserves death. And they spit in his face. They struck him. Some slapped him, saying, prophesy to you, uh, us, to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You've said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Well, then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear many things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the word.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a great day today. An exciting day. It's always a good day. It's especially a good day this year because we're not fighting a snowstorm like we were last year on Palm Sunday. Thankful for that, although you know, I was a little bit concerned about the rain in the early service. It really kind of had things uh, rocking for a little bit, but it seems to, there seems to be a little sunshine here, so it's a good day. It's a good day. It's always a good day to be able to have these confirmands come and confirm the faith and the promises that God had given to them in their baptisms. It's especially exciting for me because for a lot of them, it was at this baptismal font that they were baptized in the first place, and, and I was the one who had the privilege of baptizing them, so that's exciting. It's also exciting because in our early service today, uh, we were able to receive a number of new adult members, five that's, you know, we don't usually get to receive that many at one time as adults, and so that was exciting. It's always good to see so many people who are able to be here for this service, uh, especially people who are you know, members who have been away for a while or coming back because they're family members who, you know, who are being confirmed, and, and then also family and friends who are not members of our congregation, perhaps some who really don't know much about Christianity or Lutheranism. So this is a great opportunity, really, for, uh, to, to not only celebrate the confer confirmation of the faith, but to give some explanation of, of what the faith is about. And, and for that reason, whether you're someone who has uh, been here often, or it's been a little while since you've been here, or being here for the first time, perhaps even hearing the gospel for the first time. We are absolutely thrilled that everyone here is able to be here. Now, for the sake of the people who weren't here during the Lenten season, we've been going through a series. It's really been one of my favorite series of all that I've ever uh, developed over the years. We've been looking at Jesus and especially his final year of ministry and, and that final journey to Jerusalem, like a court case. Because it's laid out that way. Because Jesus was constantly being cross-examined by persecuting prosecutors, we've called them. And the kinds of questions that Jesus was asked by those persecutors back then are oftentimes the very same kinds of questions that we are being asked as Christians these days. And so we've learned some things about some of those tough questions. I'm not going to recap everything that we've talked about, but I do want to say that today we're going to be talking about questions about truth, which really is underlying all of that because what we've discovered over the weeks is that when you talk about what's right and wrong and where Christians have authority to speak and not speak, where they can speak, when they can speak their faith, questions about suffering, all of that stuff, what we find is there's not a lot of agreement on that in this culture, in this society. And there's not a lot of agreement even in our churches. And so what I want to make a case for today is there is such a thing as absolute truth. The reason why there is so much disagreement, uh, certainly because we live in such a diverse culture, but also we are living in a culture that wants to say there, are no, there is no such thing as absolute truth. I want to say that there is. And the absolute truth that I want to point to is absolute biblical truths. Throughout the season in all of the bulletins, in the upper right-hand corner, it, it had the title of the, the series, The Cross-Examination of Christ and Christianity. And then it says a Lent and Easter series that is preparing us to be able to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Because it's only through God's help that we're able to do that. Now it's obvious, I think, that that, that is a word play on the, the oath that is given in the courtrooms in courts throughout our nation. And, and interestingly enough, it's almost identical to the, the oath that is oftentimes given in other courtrooms throughout the world. To tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
It's almost universal. And what's more important and interesting is that it's also universal that in most cases they will say, so help me God. Now, those are, that's an oath. We are living in a culture now that has sometimes given people the option of what's called an affirmation in court. Where instead of saying, so help me God, and, and there's no holy book involved, they will say, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, under the pains and penalties of perjury. Well, perjury is an, a, a, a serious crime. It can be punishable by up to five years in prison for people who perjure themselves, who don't tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This is very precise language. Tell the truth, the whole truth. You can't just say part of the truth and not say the rest of it and then kind of hold back on important details if you know them. Because that's not telling the whole truth, and that can be very deceptive. Nothing but the truth. You can't say, well, I told the truth because I told this part was the truth. It was really true, but this part was not true. You've got to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. In the, in the state of California, perjury in a murder case can also be subject, a perjurer can be subject to capital punishment there. It doesn't happen very often, but it's, it's that serious. And if perjury is that serious among those people in a court of law over secular issues with God as our witness, then certainly our perjury of speaking something that is not true to what God's word teaches, not true to what God wants to reveal to you and to me about what the truth is, what God has revealed to each of these young people and what they have confessed today, then certainly we are going to be held liable for that. Now, even in a court of law and, and in other situations, it's true that, that people will give their best understanding of the truth. In a court case, they may uh, not know the truth, but then when they hear more evidence, then they will change their testimony or, or their statement of what is true. And the same thing is, uh, happens in the church. We want to confess, we want to teach, we want to instruct, so that whether we're talking about young people in the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, or adults, that they have been introduced to the truth, at least as we know it. You see, this is the issue that so many people have. This is the kind of questions that people will ask us. They'll, they'll say things like, well, what makes you think that you have a monopoly on the truth? They'll say things like, well, that's just your interpretation of the Bible, not mine. Well, that's true for you, but not for me, as if somehow two contradictory statements can stand. So how do we deal with that? Hopefully, we'll be able to continue to have the conversation. But sometimes people will say, why do you Christians just keep pushing your, your, your side of the truth, your idea of truth on us? And we talked about it last Wednesday. Out of love out of a care, out of a concern. But we're not going to force it. We can't. We, we, we need to be careful about that. If someone, usually what I'll do in those conversations is ask, is it okay if we talk about this? Is it okay if I ask you a question? And then, if they say no, and then say, well, fine. We don't have to talk about that. And there are times where I've had to you know, back off and say, no, we, we won't talk about church stuff. We'll just talk about mundane things because they didn't want to talk about it. But when there are people who want to hear, who want to know at least our side of the truth, to have the conversation, to say, well, yeah, there is differences here. And, and so let's come to the truth together. Let's try to get a, a mutual understanding of what is good, what is right, what is true. If it's true in a courtroom, it's certainly true for us as well. And, and we find this, it, it's, it's covered in the Ten Commandments. And the Second Commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. It's saying if we're making an oath in a court, then we need to be truthful. And then the Eighth Commandment, which says you shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor, that means we need to be truthful in both cases. One, in, in regard to our relationship with the Lord and what's true in terms of teaching and doctrine. In, the, in, the, in Luther's explanation, he covers it. He says, 
We should fear and love God so that I will not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name. And likewise, in the Eighth Commandment, he tells us when we're talking about other people that we don't want to betray them. We don't want to slander them. We don't want to tell lies about our neighbor, but we want to defend them, speak well of them, and explain everything in the kindest way. But if we're living in a, in a culture, in a society that's going to, to forfeit the truth based on the, the whims of, of, a, of a society that changed from day to day, then truth is going to be compromised. And this isn't new. We heard it today in the gospel lessons. Jesus' opponents had a problem with the truth. They had it in their head that they, the, the, the priests and, and Caiaphas, he was the one who said it, you know, if it's better that one man would die than that the whole nation would die. They were concerned that if Jesus and his popularity got to be too much, too strong, that somehow it was going to kind of push the Jews out of the picture, that it was going to cause an uprising, it was going to cause problems, that the Romans would lash out against that, and so for their own protection, we need to do something about this. We're going to put this man to death. Even if he's innocent, we're going to put him to death. And that's why they asked the questions that they did. That's why they brought these witnesses. And then they wanted Jesus to speak up, and at first he didn't. And when he did, then they used that as what they considered evidence against him. It was a, a convenient truth for them that would help them to, to believe a lie. Pontius Pilate, he saw right through it. He even cynically asked the question, what is truth? He was amazed that Jesus didn't answer these people. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He knew that Jesus could have gotten off. All he would have had to do was answer them a little bit, be his own witness to testify. Jesus was silent. He couldn't figure that out. His hands were tied as far as in his own mind. But really, really, it was a matter of not standing up for the truth, but being pushed around by the culture, the whims of a society at that time. And, and the people, people who had sung out hosannas on a Sunday, who are now calling crucify him on a Friday. It's a pretty good example to us of how sometimes the winds of what people think can push us around and lead us away from the truth. What these young people have learned, what they have grown to learn is what the scriptures have told us. And, and the way it always works is it, and, and it's important to, to look at that in a, in a logical way because, you know, certainly it's illogical to say that there can be two truths and, and that even when they're opposed to one another. If there are two opposing points of view, they could both be wrong, but they both cannot be right. One could be right, one could be wrong, but they both can't be right. That's illogical. What we do is we remember simple rules of logic that says true statements, true, true premises will lead to truths. And also in the, in the reverse, if there is something that is true, then what will follow from that are also true premises. Today, our, our young people sang the song, Christ Be My Leader, and you may have heard John 14, 6 in that song, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does Jesus mean when he says he is the truth? Aren't there lots of truths, truths about a lot of things? And what he's saying is, is that when it, talks, when it comes to spiritual things, Jesus' truth must be connected to everything that we believe and teach. You heard it in the, in the vows that they made when, they, when Jesus says, you know, all authority has been given to me. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you. All of those things that are true. I'm going to use a, an example. I've, I've used it for anybody that's been to my catechism classes. I've talked about this. I usually don't bring a wheel with me. But I like to use this as an example because this is what it's all about. When Jesus says, I am the truth and all other truths, everything that we believe and teach in the scriptures has to be connected to Christ. Every denomination, every religion for that matter, whether you're talking about Allah or Buddha or anything, they all have a hub, a central teaching. Islam, 
that Allah is God, Allah is good. For some denominations, it's the, Holy, the, the Heavenly Father is their hub. For some, the Holy Spirit is their hub. For us, as Lutherans, Jesus Christ is the hub. And everything that we teach, every doctrine, is like a spoke that is connected to the hub. Now, at my house, I've got a little wrench. It's called a spoke wrench. And if any of these spokes ever gets too tight or too loose then what will happen is the wheel will not turn true. This wheel turns true. But if, it's, if, the, if the spokes are loose, it'll start to wobble like that. I think that that's a good example of what happens in Christendom these days. There are people who feel so strongly about a certain teaching that it times that pulls it too tight and it confuses, it pulls things out of true. There are some people who are so loose about certain teachings that it that it relaxes it so it doesn't turn true. Now when I say that, what I want to say to all of the people who are guests from other churches, you know, yes, what we believe is the truth. I wouldn't believe it, I wouldn't preach it if I didn't think it was true. But along with that, we're not saying that people of other denominations are not saved, that their faith is not genuine. Their wheel may be a little wobbly, but they'll still get to the place that, that we all want to go. But we want to go in a way that is true. Because sometimes the wheel can be so out of true that it can cause an accident. It can cause a disaster. It may mean that someone is not saved because of a false belief or a false truth. And so what we want to do as God's people is share those truths in a way that, that is a dialogue. G Martin Luther himself, when he was called before the council to recant the things that he had written, he simply said, unless Holy Scripture and pure logic convince me otherwise, I cannot say anything or do anything different. I, I will not recant. Here I stand. I can say no other. He was true to what he believed. And what he believed, we say, is true to what the scriptures taught. It's connected to what Jesus had done on the cross for us. It's connected to what Jesus has done for us. It, it, it starts with the simple truths, and in the, in the catechism, it's set, this way, uh, set up this way. The Ten Commandments, we all get the Ten Commandments. We're pretty well on the same page there. The Apostles' Creed, which we will confess in just a moment, we're pretty much on the same page there. The Lord's Prayer, it's baptism, confession, and absolution, and then the Lord's Supper. That's where things start to get a little bit confusing. But the way we work that out is by starting with the simple truths that we can agree on then and build toward greater truths. That's our goal. Jesus prayed for unity, and so it's our responsibility, our our moral obligation, really, to speak the truth, to encourage other people to seek the truth with us so that we too could say, here we stand. It's not just Martin Luther who said that stuff, but Jesus himself. I want you to listen to the Old Testament lesson where 700 years before Jesus' crucifixion, he spoke these words as a pre-incarnate Christ. Lord God has given me the tongue of those who were taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who were taught. The Father awakening Jesus. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, I turned not backward. This is where we, it gets very specific here, very precise. I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I hide not my face from disgrace and spirit. But the Lord helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. He will con who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Let us stand together.
we stand now and confess our common faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's found on the back cover of your songbooks. I believe in God the Father Almighty. You may be seated. 